look behind me. There are fish eating right now. And there's so many things you need to catch that very fish right there. But there are so many things you don't need. That's what I'm here to tell you. There are at least five things in fly fishing you can get rid of today. You're about to go fly fishing. You drive up to your favorite stream, you get out of the car. What's the first thing you put on after your waders? Your vest, right? No, that's wrong. This is something you don't need in fly fishing. You don't need a vest. Gosh, 30 years ago, it was like Christmas. It was one of my first fly fishing gifts. It was my first fly fishing vest. I was so excited to load it up with my strike indicators, my split shot, all of my flies. I carried like 25,000 flies, seriously. But I didn't need a vest. And I didn't even realize that I didn't need a vest at that time. So what do you need? That's really up to you and what you're going to do. Over the years, I've worn so many different things. I mean, right now, I prefer a sling pack. There's just something that's nice about my sling pack. I feel like I can put everything in there, but I can sling it out of the way and I feel less cumbersome. I've also worn a backpack because it's really nice because if I'm fishing and I'm not changing my flies a lot, I can keep my backpack on, it's out of my way. I've also worn a hip pack. It's nice because I kind of feel like I'm going down the minimalist route. And then finally, if you don't feel like bringing anything, you only need to carry like a handful of things on the water. Get a shirt, like my nice Theo shirt, it has a little pocket right here. Put your flies, your tippet, your hemostats in your pocket. You are good to go. What does everyone love to do at the fly shop? Come on, you know. You love to go in there, find the most expensive fly rod and wiggle it and see what it feels like. Now, do you need to own that most expensive fly rod? You don't. I know what you're gonna say. Tim, you do, and yes, I do. I used to build bamboo fly rods. They were pricey when I sold them. I own this beautiful Orvis Blackout right now. It's pricey. Now. Do you pay for what you get? There's no doubt about it, I believe you do. Some people can argue you're paying for advertising, you're paying for a warranty, yeah, maybe, but I look at it, I'm paying for that taper design, I'm paying for a lightweight tool, I'm paying for a lot of stuff whenever I get those high-end fly rods, but I also fish with a lot of fly rods that aren't that high-end. So if you have a question about kind of you're choosing between one or two fly rods, shoot me an email, it's on the screen right now, and I will give you some honest feedback about which one I prefer and why. But high-end fly rods, you don't need to own them all. There's some fish rising behind me right now, but there's one thing that's not here that I definitely don't need whenever I go back there. That's the wind. Gosh, I love to fly fish in the elements. A little snow, a little drizzle, give me a cloudy day, I'm all in. Enter the wind, game over when it comes to fly fishing. This one time at a rod gathering, the great Joan Wolf was there. She was doing some casting demonstrations and gosh, she's just an incredible fly caster, no doubt about it. So then she took some questions from the audience and this one gentleman raised his hand and he said, Joan, what do you do when there's a lot of wind? And she said, very honestly, you go to another place because th that's the reality of fly fishing. You can't fly fish in the wind. Can you change your location and try to cast with the wind? Absolutely. But I think he was looking for this great answer where you tighten your loop, you get low to the ground, it just doesn't work when wind's at play. So fly fishing and wind, they just don't coexist. If you're into social media, be sure to use that hashtag trout and feather so I can see what you're posting about and I can learn basically where you're fishing, what you're fishing, the flies you're tying, all that fun stuff. Come on, where do you think I'm gonna get my future video ideas from? All of you with that hashtag trout and feather. But be sure to add trout and feather on whatever social media platform you use. I'd love to connect with all of you there. Do you love bugs? insects, do you like to figure out what trout eat? Me too. But good news, we do not have to be an entomologist to do so. So no, we don't need to have anyone on the water with us kind of identifying what each bug is, what its Latin name is, all that fun stuff. Thankfully, we don't need that. Is it good to have an idea of what trout are eating? Absolutely. Can I explain the mayfly or the caddisfly life cycle? Absolutely. Do you understand it? I sure hope so. But do you have to be an entomologist and know every single thing there is about every single insect in the world? No, you don't, and that's a good thing. What's my recommendation? It's very simple. At least understand all the food sources and all the food items that fish do eat. I'm gonna put a book up right now. It's called Trout and Their Food by Dave Whitlock. This is a very easy read. You're gonna read it once, you're gonna say, wow, that was too easy. You're gonna read it a second time and say, this is everything fishy. And that really breaks it down. So my recommendation, look down below in the description, check out that book, it's a great one. And if you have any other recommendations of books out there, by all means, drop them in the comments. Before I drop the number one thing you don't need, please pause and like this video. I truly appreciate all of the support. Thanks for all of you who are following me, especially on Instagram, 
Facebook, all of those wonderful social media platforms. Now let's get back to this because I'm gonna to try to stir a little bit of controversy with this number one thing you don't need. I'm sorry, I'm gonna say it, the parachute atoms. I'm not a parachute atoms kind of guy. Yeah, I know what you're gonna say. You're gonna be blowing me up in the comments saying, Tim, it works everywhere. It works in Iceland, Montana, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Alaska. They work all around the world down in South America. That's great. I don't fish the parachute atoms and I feel like I've done pretty well for myself when it comes to fishing. Now, is there something special or magical about the fly? I don't know, it's a gray bodied parachute. That's wonderful. Do I have some in my box? Yes. Do I fish them often? Not really. If my buddy says, hey Tim, they're eating parachute atoms, I'm gonna say great. And I'm probably gonna stick with another mayfly or another caddisfly imitation and catch fish too. Because I've kind of learned over the years that there's something about confidence in fly fishing. And gosh, that parachute atoms, it is just a confidence fly for so many fly fishers. And that's a great thing if it's one of those flies for you. But for anyone else that's new to fly fishing, new to fly tying, and you're like, what's that one thing that I need? And somebody tells you, you need the parachute atoms, you don't need it. It's a great dry fly, it's gonna catch a lot of fish, but there are lots of other patterns out there too. Send me an email and I'll tell you my three favorite dry flies. There's my email address right now. All right, was that enough controversy for all of you? And every time you tie a parachute atoms on, and you post a picture of it on Instagram, put hashtag trout and feather and just rub it in a little bit because you know I'm probably not tying that fly. So we talked about things you don't need in fly fishing. Here is something you do need. Click this playlist. It includes a list of all the videos that I referenced during this one. We're talking about things like my favorite Euro nymphing rod. That video is in here. Some of my favorite fly rods, the sling pack. If I talked about it during this video, you can find it right here. Click this playlist. You can thank me later.